Namaste, good morning, good evening, and greetings to all the health seekers and Gandhian philosophy enthusiasts who have joined from all over the world. We are going to have an enlightening and knowledgeful day as today is the day of second webinar in the series of 48 days webathon themed around Mahatma Gandhi, the healer, his views on self-health reliance and other determinants of public health. This webathon is organized by National Institute of Naturopathy, Pune, as a tribute to celebrating 150 years of Mahatma Gandhi. Yesterday being the 151st birth anniversary of Gandhiji, the webathon had commenced in consonance with flagging off of the 150 mega naturopathy camps by NIN Pune at Panaji, Goa last year, the same day. Before moving forward in the schedule, it is reminded, it is reminded to all of us that today's talk and the next ones are all interactive, that is, Viewers can post their queries in the YouTube and Facebook comment section. These questions will be addressed at the question and answer session at the end of the talk. Moving forward into the schedule, Gandhiji had said that prayer or bhajan is the key of the morning and the bolt of the night. As he correctly said, we shall follow him all by starting today's morning with a Gandhian bhajan in Tamil language, sung by Shri Makaran Masramji of Regional Outreach Bureau, Pune. Gandhi in Rodaman, in Rum 
well that was a very be fitting uh, start to the today's morning and uh, this uh, song's name the prayer's name was gandhi and roar in uh, tamil language and it celebrates the 
nature of mahatma gandhi saying that now we move on to the next segment of our today's uh, webinar that is this uh, that is we shall be continuing with gandhi katha so this 48 days festival of knowledge shall be celebrating gandhi ji's lesser known and non political insights on minute intricacies of life like food sleep clothing walking exercise etc apart from through the webinars we shall be receiving wisdom from him through gandhi katha meaning an stories of gandhi ji's every day till the end of webathon on naturopathy day that is november 18th 2020 Today's story is narrated by Professor Dr. K. Satyalakshmi, Director of National Institute of Naturopathy, Pune. Hello, friends. Let us. listen to mahatma gandhi's stories so today's story is rao ji bhai's experience getting treatment by gandhi ji you know one while mahatma gandhi was in south africa in phoenix ashram uh, this rao ji bhai came to him with severe crippling disease of rheumatism all his joints were so painful that he could not even barely sit stand or walk for a while so this was the condition mahatma gandhi understood that uh, what is wrong because rao ji bhai had the habit of eating too much and intermittently without maintaining any kind of restriction very impulsively so mahatma gandhi started explaining to him what went wrong and it is possible to correct his situation then rao ji bhai happily agreed to undergo nature cure treatment uh, under the guidance of mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi then started his diet prescription wherein he was asked to eat only raw foods fruits which are not sour so rao ji bhai started and then mahatma gandhi every day in the morning would give him oil bath and enema the enema which is uh, made of lukewarm water and mixed with castor oil and after enema can you believe he used to check the pot and then understand whether this man is able to digest well or not so this was the commitment with which mahatma gandhi used to treat his patients then he would also clean the pot because the patient was so uh, crippling or painful that he would not able to do then after that he would make patient take tap and sun bath with all these treatments rao ji bhai improved so well that in 3 months time he was able to walk he was able to do all his things without now when rao ji bhai remembers this incident after 20 years which he wrote in his book that when in the morning when he used to go for treatment from mahatma gandhi the way he would touch his head you know the very feeling of a motherly touch only a mother unhesitantly looks at the fecal matter of the child similarly mahatma gandhi would examine the fecal matter and then clean the pot and help his patients you know this was the kind of commitment we could see in mahatma gandhi the healer you understand he not only treated diseases but he healed wounds deep seated wounds with his touch thank you this is the story for the day thank you so much ma'am for such a mind freshening story to start the day with so in connection to the story uh, we can say that gandhi ji is very rarely perceived as a medical healer by many of us to those who are surprised by the fact in this story 
there are more surprising and exciting facts every day to know them make sure you tune in to our social media channels 11 am to 12 pm every day till this coming nashtrapati day that is on november 18th 2020 now the nectar for our ears was really sweet we now shall treat our eyes with the visual nectar in the form of a film titled mahatma gandhi and nature cure it is requested of the administrator to please play the short uh, rare footage of gandhi ji and he subscribed to the view that all ailments are due to the violation of nature's laws and that return to nature is the road to health he opened the nature cure clinic at uroli kanchan a village near pune and examined the patients his prescriptions emphasized use of the five elements of nature earth water air sun and sky for he believe that in simple natural remedies lies the villagers hope gandhi's outlook on nature cure was essentially spiritual seeking to purify his physical self he read treatises on nature cure his dislike for medicine steadily increased and he fasted and experimented in dietetics he had great faith in earth treatment and applied the mud poultice to ailing patients he wrote guide to health to help the people to keep the temple of the spirit the human body in a fit condition He believed that perfect health can be attained by living in obedience to the laws of God. The walls were no barriers to his thought. He wrote a primer for children which stressed the importance of a clean body and a composed mind, of prayer, spinning and nature study. This short film was compiled by the collaboration between National Institute of Naturopathy Pune and National Film Archives of India to which we extend our sincere gratitudes. Before moving forward in the schedule it is again reminded to all of us that today's talk and the next ones are all interactive that is viewers can post their queries in the YouTube and Facebook comment section these questions will be addressed at the Q&A session at the end of the talk. Continuing the legacy of Mahatma, which we have just witnessed in the rare footage, National Institute of Naturopathy Pune has inaugurated a tribal unit integrated with NIN Pune Sanatorium for Immune Deficiency Disorders at Gohe Budruk village of Ambegaon Taluka in Pune. This project of National Institute of Naturopathy Pune, an inpatient ventilated facility, truly epitomizes its beliefs in gandhi ji's ideals as it has become the pioneer among naturopathy institutes of the country as it is going to back to basics rather than to 
towards the superfluous modernity. This ambitious project of extending holistic healthcare and healthcare education to the community and youth in the tribal area will stand as a source of inspiration to all naturopaths and other medical practitioners in walking alongside the spirit of Mahatma, who said, we find ourselves when we lose ourselves in the service of others. So we are very much happy and excited to share this a new information regarding National Institute of Naturopathy's extension into the new forte that is the tribal community. And now we move forward into the schedule. And again, it is reminded that the we are going to head into the main uh, portion of the today's webinar that is the talk. And before that, all the viewers are reminded that you can post your queries in the Facebook and YouTube section which will be later addressed after the Q and uh, in the Q&A session. So we have now arrived at the main portion of today's curiously awaited webinar for which I feel immensely grateful to have the opportunity of introducing the uh, today's expert speaker, Sri Professor Gita Dharampalji. Today, we are fortunate and blessed by Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge, to be receiving insights of wisdom from Srimati Professor Gita Dharampalji, an international scholar who has a strong focus in the field of Gandhian studies. Srimati Gita Ji is currently extending her academic services as the Dean of Research to the Gandhi Research Foundation, a modern philanthropic institute for the education and propagation of the Gandhian legacy, situated on the outskirts of Jalgaon city in the state of Maharashtra state in India. Formerly, she had been a professor at Heidelberg University in Germany where she headed the Department of History of the University's South Asia Institute. She retired from this position in 2018. She has interdisciplinary academic training in various fields, namely literature and philosophy from the universities of Manchester in England and Leipzig in East Germany, social anthropology from Cambridge, England, and Indian cultural history from SOAS London and the Sorbonne Paris. Her professional dissertation focused on early modern history. Her publications and research focus on topics ranging from pre-modern transcultural interactions between Europe and India, the maritime cultural history of the Indian Ocean region during 1400s to 1800s, medical history, religious ritual transformations during 1500s to 2000, the socio-cultural and political history of the colonial period in general with a special emphasis on Mahatma Gandhi's movement of political and cultural resurgence. Srimati Gita Ji has held visiting fellowships and professorships at various international institutions such as the Stanford University USA as well as at Indian universities in Delhi, Kolkata and Hyderabad among others. She is the daughter of Sri Dharampal Ji, a renowned Gandhian thinker who had contributed extensively to our understanding of Gandhi. And saying that I would uh, urge all the viewers to refer to his book titled Understanding Gandhi by Other India Press, which was released in 2003. She ha and uh, Sri Dharampal Ji has also contributed to Indian history through his pioneering publications, such as The Beautiful Tree, an indigenous Indian education in the 18th century, published in 1982, Indian Science and Technology in the 18th century, published 1971, and Civil Disobedience and Indian Tradition, published 1971. These much acclaimed works have been pivotal in reappraising and refuting conventional and negative views of India's recent history by instead underscoring the cultural, scientific and technological achievements of Indian society at the eve of the British conquest. Srimati Gita Ji is heartily welcomed to today's talk by National Institute of Naturopathy with the Institute's gratitude to her for being an important and dedicated contributor to the fusion, fruition of a MOU between Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon, and National Institute of Naturopathy, Pune. We cordially invite you to the panel, ma'am. This is a great honor for me. Um, I feel uh, completely humbled. And um, since I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor, just a historian, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do justice to this topic, but I'm, I'll be taking a slightly different perspective, uh, but it, I think I shall be in, um, emphasizing the healing aspect. And since I am uh, in my home office, my connectivity is not very good. 
So, and I will be showing you slides so that um, you can uh, understand um, what I'm saying uh, from a dynamic perspective. Uh, but um, uh, I can't, you won't be able to see me as well. Otherwise, it will be too much for my system. So I will be invisible. But uh, to um, compensate for this, you will see some interesting slides. So I look forward to your questions at the end of, of this session. Then uh, I will start um, my, um, my presentation. So So as you know, Gandhi is considered to be father of the nation, not just because of the crucial role he played in India gaining her independence, but, sorry, we're having a problem showing the slides. Is there a problem there? I may assist you, ma'am. Yes. Yes. So now we are set. I hope you can see the slides. So Gandhi, as the father of the nation, he, he's not, not just because of the crucial role that he played in India, um, or India gaining her independence, but also because he represented and upheld the quintessence of Indian civilization. And this is exemplified by Ranga's famous cartoon. It's the so-called Gandhi India map. Gandhi is India and India is Gandhi, which not only underscores that Gandhi inspired the birth of the Indian nation, but also that he received his inspiration from the Indian people. For he, I'm quoting, gave voice to what was in the hearts of ordinary Indians. And this is what Gandhi himself explicitly acknowledged over and over again. So could there be a more appropriate visualization of this symbiotic union? However, if we look a little bit more closely at this Gandhi India map, a painful, troubling sub subtext can also be discerned. We perceive that Gandhi has his back turned to us, to the nation that he fathered, for the nation state that came into being was quite contrary to his deepest convictions. Hence, the epithet, father of the nation, is replete with sad irony. So today, um, I would, today I'd like to trace with you how Gandhi came to practice politics as an art of healing and how he thereby effectuated the feat of negotiating a number of divergent rules, roles, namely as a creative thinker, a political leader, a social reformer, but above all as a deeply religious person, a rare combination of functions which he exercised with utmost integrity and commitment. And as you see on the right-hand side of this slide, there's a quote, I have nothing new to teach the world. Truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. All I have done is to try experiments in both on as vast a scale as I could. So this uh, concise statement sums up with characteristic modesty, Gandhi's life strivings, though self-effacingly eschewing any originality in realizing his ideational lodestars truth and nonviolence, yet in emphasizing their universal and perennial significance, it is through his creative experiments with them, epitomizing his life's message that Gandhi ingeniously succeeded in catching the imagination of a global public. Transformed into an icon of the 20th century, Gandhi's Enigma continues to exercise a fascination for our contemporary world, but his life strivings were defined also by three other fundamental, uh, fundamental premises 
deeply rooted in Indian civilization, namely namely first and foremost by Karuna, which signifies compassion in action for recognizing the oneness of all uh, beings and indeed of all living species in our diversity, in our biodiversity, Gandhi extended Karuna to others to, re to relieve their suffering. As his favorite hymn, Vaishnava Jan, extols so paradigmatically. Not, and this was not just out of love that he extended his uh, Karuna to others, but because it is an entirely logical do thing to do. Because of this sense of em empathetic oneness experienced by Gandhi, uh, this is also highlighted, for instance, in Africa, the African philosophy of Ubuntu. I am, of course, we are. Karuna for Gandhi was a direct antidote to cruelty. It helped eliminate callousness and indifference to others', others woes. And yet, being selfless compassion, Karuna expects nothing in return, not even gratitude. So inspired by Gandhi's example today, Karuna can indeed function as a psycho-spiritual vaccine against the coronavirus, I would say. But secondly, Gandhi's habitus, that is his way of life, was defined by dharma. And of course, all of you know what this means. And thirdly, and this is most crucial, Gandhi was deeply convinced that Indian civilization was basically sound, but that it was wounded. Uh, you may recall V.S. Nepal's India, A Wounded Civilization, a famous book by him. But for Gandhi, the cause of this being wounded was different. In Hinswara, He exclaims, Gandhi exclaims, India is being ground down, is being subjugated, not under the English heel, but under that of modern civilization. End of quote. What's more, the materialism and inherent violence of modernity, according to Gandhi's understanding, was a disease from which, Gandhi, from which India, in particular, a westernized elite had to be cured of this disease. And how? By the application of his politics of an art of healing with the aim of attaining Swaraj, that means restoring India's health. For him, attaining Swaraj was a means of restoring health to the Indian nation. And this he considered the restoring of health and the attainment of Suraj, he considered to be his mission as a true patriot. And it's quite telling that Gandhi's first biography published in 1909 by Joseph Doe is entitled Gandhi, an Indian patriot in South Africa. Moreover, by calling modern civilization a disease to which according to him, the English first and foremost had fallen victim Gandhi rhetorically turns the tables on the colonial discourse, which branded Indian society and environment as being diseased. So you see, Gandhi, in using the, this turn of phrase, was also a champion of political re rhetoric. Besides uh, being a, besides being a political healer. And this, and especially his radical transformative kind of healing politics, was certainly taken note of uh, in the international media. Let me give you one example, moving in the fast forward mode uh, to 1947, to the eve of independence. Gandhi is seen by a global trend setting media such as Time magazine as performing a superhuman feat effectuating the decline of the British Empire on which, in line with the popular cliche, the sun never set. The dedication of this cover and accompanying article was appreciative praise indeed, especially since it came from the American editors of Time magazine, 
And Bo Boris Chalyapin is the ingenious cover artist illustrator. A lot of work should be done on him. But this tribute is made somewhat mystifying by the caption formulated under the photo of Gandhi, who is portrayed uh, with his intense gaze, clutching in both his emaciated hands, eight bamboo stems declaring, can you read the caption? Well, I needed a magnifying glass to decipher the caption, uh, to decipher it. And it says, I wish to wrestle with the snake. And this statement about wrestling with the states, uh, let me read it for you. If I seem to take part in politics, it's only because politics today encircles us like the coil of a snake from which one cannot and justify, in particular to Lokmanya Tilip, his intense involvement in the Indian independence movement way back in 1920. Even today, we can tangibly sense its forceful message when the grip of politics is more insidious and snake-like than ever. But what's so amazing is that Gandhi's antidote to the political serpent's venom and his means to extract himself from the serpent's encoilment was to adamantly practice uh, religion defined by nonviolence and uh, above all by karuna to have a healing impact on the nation. Yet simultaneously, he, re he refused to be revered as a saint or stigmatized as a politician, as underscored in the article in his journal, Young India, and reiterated by him time and again. But he would probably not have been against being called a healer. So maybe he didn't want to be called a Mahatma, but a political healer, I think he would have considered that to be an appropriate epithet for him. But now let me indicate some crucial signposts on his journey towards becoming a healer of the nation. Shortly after his arrival in South Africa in May 1893 to serve as a legal counsel for a Gujarati Muslim merchant, he was thrown off the train for presuming to sit in a first class compartment for which he had a valid ticket. This personal affront precipitated the most creative night of his life as he decided at the cold mountain station of Peter Maritzburg to overcome his anger at this insulting treatment and instead to turn his attention to the much larger questions of racial prejudice or the disease of color prejudice, injustice and exploitation directed against his fellow Indians in South Africa, numbering about 100,000 by the European colonists. Once again, it is significant how with this linguistic turn of phrase, disease of color prejudice, Gandhi skillfully inverted the cliched colonial categorization of Asians being backward and diseased, determined, so determined to cure, um, to cure the British and the Dutch colonists of this disease. He wanted to cure the colonists of the, this disease. He became an ardent social political activist. He co-founded in 1894, the Natal Indian Congress, which was to inspire the birth of the African people's organization in 1902 and the African National Congress in 19, 1912. I want to mention these things because sometimes this is ignored and one considers that Gandhi did not appreciate Africans and Africans didn't appreciate him. But this is not the case. I've written a, a, an article that has just been published on Gandhi's role uh, um, in, in uh, furthering the cause of African uh, freedom. Um, but uh, let me get back to Gandhi. But besides uh, uh, founding the Natal Indian Congress, he also set up an ambulance corps to attend to the wounded in the Anglo Boer War of 1899, exemplifying karuna, compassion in action, even towards the colonists. Because he was attending to the wounded um, British soldiers and the, uh, the wounded Boers, um, although they were. Uh, um, although they were opponents. And he was also pivotal during the outbreak of the plague 
in 1904. And from his healing intervention, we could learn a lot to come to terms with our COVID-19 pandemic of today. But it was during the Zulu, Zulu rebellion of 1906, where he acted as a stretcher bearer, that he experienced the Zulu's brutal massacre at the hands of the British colonists, which shook him to his core and led to his radical transformation into a political leader. And this just in time to oppose the discriminatory Black Act for which Gandhi uh, launched his first nonviolent Satyagraha on the 11th of September, 1906 inspired by his Muslim brethren and to the far reaching implications of this other non-violent 9-11, I shall return at the end. But as a result of Gandhi's politics of healing, the previously timid and amorphous Indian migrants became transformed into a united and resolute community. And this message of dignified resoluteness was heeded and made an impact even in London, the distant imperial metropolis. Um, and this is reflected in the following, in this cartoon with its comic connotations that was published in the London Sunday Times at the beginning of 1907, entitled Passive Resistance in the Transvaal, the Steamroller versus the Elephant, with the caption, the elephant, that is the Indian community under Gandhi's leadership, sat tight, and the steamroller exploded. So when Gandhi Satyagraha ca campaign got underway against the united, stubborn, and relentless force of the Indian community, represented by the Indian uh, by the elephant blocking its path, the governmental steamroller found it could not make head headway. And what is significant is that the atmosphere, the atmosphere of fear, paramount previously, seems to have vanished. This was always one of Gandhi's prime concerns for an atmosphere of fear, according to him, impeded any real lasting agreement between opposing parties and he and him was an obstacle to any healing that took, was to take place. So after his relatively successful politics in healing, um, um, in exercising a healing influence, uh, in the political sphere in South Africa, returning in January 1915 to India, which was more or less paralyzed by colonial subjugation, Gandhi was able to bring about, within a few years, a radical transformation among the mass of the population. Freed from their paralyzing fear, the people had become empowered and self-assured. Politics had become indigenized through a restructured Indian National Congress, which was uh, uh, transformed from a westernized debating club into a nonviolent political mass movement. The village economy was getting regenerated through, through the revival of the charka and the production of khadi and the Swadeshi movement, uh, um, regenerating village industries. Caste, class, and gender discrimination was being mit mitigated. The role of women in the freedom movement is, is really impressive. And Hindu-Muslim unity was being endeavored. Gandhi's role um, as a political healer par excellence in bringing about this radical transformation is noted by the international media, of which one example is this German cartoon showing India, the elephant, at the height of the Khilafat movement, moving towards freedom under the guidance of Gandhi, despite the frantic efforts of the British establishment to hold it by brute force. Please note the way in which the towering stature of Gandhi, the political leader um, the, and the political healer, uh, enthroned on the giant Indian elephant, is contrasted with the puny figures of the colonial police. And here is just one concrete example of Gandhi's healing per se. You see an artist's impression of Gandhi's compassionate service to the leper, Parturi Shastri, whom Gandhi hosted and treated personally at his honored, as his honored guest uh, in Sevagram Ashram, despite all 
concerns that he may himself get infected. The traits that enable Gandhi to be a healer, his compassionate, his uh, compassionate nature, his sense of justice, his integri integrity, he practiced what he preached, his courage, his self-sacrificing nature, and above all, his deep commitment to the welfare of the poor. These were complemented by his astute understanding of political and social and economic developments. For example, his deep concern about the detrimental effects of the British salt tax, about which he wrote critical articles whilst in London as a student, in the Vegetarian Journal in 1891, and then again in South Africa in the Indian Opinion. Taking, and he took note of the fact that in 1900 and, and 1905, India was one of the largest producers of salt in the world with a yield of over 1 million or 1.2 million metric tons. And when the salt tax was doubled in 1923 under the Viceroyalty of Lord Reading, the high price of salt made it unaffordable to the common man, resulting in a number of diseases, including the increasing incidence of leprosy. Uh, this may be an important aspect for the, the naturopaths among us. Um, so defying the salt acts, Gandhi reasoned, would be an ingeniously simple, but also crucial way for many Indians to express their concern and to break a British law non-violently, an unjust British law non-violently, and to bring about a much needed nationwide healing operation uh, in all aspects, not only physical, but also uh, economic, cultural, political. But uh, that the British authorities were at a loss um, as to how to deal with this opponent and his political charisma is poignantly apparent in this cartoon by the renowned Indian cartoonist Shankar, entitled Lord Willingdon's Dilemma. For even when Gandhi was behind bars, imprisoned in Yerabda jail by Viceroy Lord Willingdon, the latter is confronted with an even greater challenge. For key, for key in hand, with key in hand, he turns round and discovers to his utter dismay that for the one Gandhi locked in, there are thousands outside. The nation had become galvanized, regenerated in health through Gandhi's Satyagraha, and there, were no, there was no holding back, leaving the colonial hierarchy paralyzed. And this is conveyed with awe-inspiring effect in an American cartoon entitled The Ghost Walks in India that appeared in the Post-Dispatch of St. Louis which shows Gandhi's ghost of nonviolent resistance with subcontinental contours, stalking India and weighing heavily on Britain's conscience. In short, through Gandhi's Satyagraha campaigns, the legitimacy of the British Raj was being demolished, which underscores Gandhi, uh, the Satyagraha's forceful impact. And he, Gandhi was able to restore the much needed health to the political constellations between the colonized and the colonizers. So Gandhi's political healing also had a ho holistic approach and it redefined the practice of politics from the grassroots. The famous oceanic circle um, analogy describes Gandhi's vision of social organization. Gandhi believed that for a nonviolent society to achieve sustainable health, it must be organized in a decentralized way. In Gandhi's own words, independence must be, begin at the bottom. Thus, every village will be a republic or panchayat, having full powers. It follows, therefore, that every village has to be self-sustained and capable of managing its affairs even to the extent of defending it itself against the whole world. This does not exclude dependence on and willing help from neighbors or from the world. It will be free and voluntary play of mutual forces. Such a society is necessarily highly cultured, according to Gandhi, in which every man and woman knows what he or she wants 
and what is more, knows that no one should want anything that others cannot have with equal labor. And this, this continues with the, the quotation that you see on the screen. In this structure composed of villages, of innumerable villages, there will be ever widening, never ascending circles. Life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom, but it will be an oceanic circle whose center will be the individual. As a concrete measure to bring about Swaraj for the whole nation on the eve of his assassination, in what was to be known as Gandhi's last test will and testament, he proposed that the Indian National Congress be dissolved. Modi would have liked this. <laughs> since, as he explained, it had outlived its use. I quote Gandhi, India has still to attain social, moral, and economic independence in terms of its 700,000 villages as distinguished from its cities and towns. This is the draft con constitution um, according to Gandhi. To achieve this goal, Gandhi proposed proposed that the Congress be disbanded and turned into a Lok Sevak Sang, a national organization of Samagra Gram Sevaks. And these voluntary rural workers should then fan out all over the country so that as resourceful local leaders, they might help reconstruct local communities and build up people's power at the grassroots with the aim of transforming the passively acquies acquiescent colonial subject the passive uh, colonial subject always agreed, um, didn't have any uh, position of his own, and you transform him into an actively engaged citizen who could then develop her capacity for public involvement and political, active political participation. For according to Gandhi, once the individual rec recognized her own political power, and used it constructively, the monopolistic effectiveness, effectiveness of state power would be reduced and its coercive authority would be morally and materially undermined. And above all, social reform was to remain the major responsibility of self-governing communities at the local level. The central government should do little more than facilitate and coordinate their work. Indeed, Gandhi firmly believed that the greater the decentralization of power in society, the greater the chances for moral, social, economic, and material progress. And above all, this would ensure the health and dynamism of Indian society. So you see, Gandhi was, had reinvented the nation. He, his project was to reinvent the nation, but of course this, this, this didn't, didn't happen. That's why in the first cartoon I showed you, his back is turned towards us. He, he uh, feels that the nation that he fathered did not uh, comply with the, the reinvention of the nation that he intended. But now, what about today? Can Gandhi's healing impact or his healing touch be affected today? Can it be effective today? In partial answer to this question, please see this cartoon from the Chicago Sun-Times dated May 1968. It was published a month after the assassination of the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, who was greatly influenced by Gandhi's Satyagraha. The cartoon portray portrays Gandhi seated on the ground, exclaiming to Martin Luther King, the odd thing about assassins, Dr. King, is that they think they think they've killed you. Its message is that Gandhi's indomitable spirit still remains alive. It can't be killed. It still remains alive. And yet now to return to what I mentioned at the beginning. The 11th of September, 1906 in Johannesburg, um, when uh, Gandhi in his coining of the term Satyagraha, he was inspired, would you believe, by the concept of jihad, but in its preeminent meaning as an inner struggle with one's, con with one's conscience, not as a holy war, but it's an inner struggle with one's own conscience or as an intense effort to gain clarity. 
This is what he understood to be the preeminent meaning of jihad and what orthodox Muslims would also say is the preeminent meaning of jihad. And this meaning of jihad as an in, inner struggle with one's own conscience inspired Gandhi's conceptualization of satyagraha as an active striving towards the attainment of truth. I hope you see the, the, the link, the symbiotic uh, link, meaning, uh, significance between the two, and which made compelling sense as a passionate affirmation to transcend the deadlock, to heal the deadlock with the racist South African regime, with creative power, with healing power, mediated through the synergy of Muslim and Hindu epistemic traditions. So in view of the impact of this event of restorative judge, uh, justice, on the fifth, of, fifth anniversary of 9-11-2001, the one that we remember uh, that is closer to us, many Americans celebrated the centenary of the first 9-11, 1906, opposite Grand Zero in New York by viewing in a cinema Attenborough's Gandhi film. And so this, um, uh, this slide is contrasting the two diametrically opposed 9-11s. And in this constellation, Gandhi could be seen as a jihadist of the nonviolent uh, variety, as a healing jihadist, and through Gandhi's mediation as a political healer, Islam can be presented as propagating a spiritual struggle with 9-11-1906 giving birth to a non-violent jihadic satyagraha contrasted against the Frankenstein monster of 9-11-2001, instilling confidence into the newly constituted in inter-religious communities of Satyagrahis, both Muslims and Hindus, Gandhi invoked the name of Khuda Ishwar and emulated the faith of the prophet. Now we hope that this, this spirit can be imbibed by us today and in our dealings, in our uh, dealings with, the, with other communities that we can put Gandhi's spirit, healing spirit into practice. So 2006 and 14 years on, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, I would say. Gandhi's healing touch is needed more uh, than ever, today more than ever, and during, especially during these corona times. Following his example, we should have feed freedom from fear. We should care for the sick. We can use nature cure, allowing the body to recover with nature's healing power. You're going to learn more about this in the, in the days and weeks to come. We can practice Swadeshi, where every kitchen can become a pharmacy. We don't need any vaccine, any allopathic vaccine. We can put into practice Gandhi's constructive program that he um, articulated in a little booklet in 1941, and it can uh, lead to startup uh, initiatives in today's India to bring about Gram Swaraj and an economy uh, of small scale. Um, and another uh, concrete example of what, uh, of Gandhi's, um, where Gandhi's initiative is being followed is the Baba uh, 150 program of the Institute uh, with which I belong, uh, the Gandhi Research Foundation. Um, there, the Baba 150 uh, program to celebrate the, uh, the cent uh, 150 years of both Gandhi and his wife Kasturba um, has selected um, 150 villages in 14 states of India uh, and focuses on six er areas of uh, involvement of activity at the rural level, namely sustainable agriculture, watershed, rural entrepreneurship, sanitation, health, and basic education. Um, so this is what one could do in practice, but following the spirit of Gandhi's talisman, uh, I think this is very, very important in these days. Let me just read it out to you. At before, the, uh, shortly before his assassination, he gave this as a note 
to a, an associate who was visiting him. I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt and when the poorest in the world, you may have seen and ask yourself, the step you contemplate is going to be of any use, um, is going to be of any use to, sorry, is going to be of any use to him or her. So um, we should follow Gandhi's talisman, and I think uh, the people who are in most need are the migrant workers who were uh, who left um, their places of work to return to the village. To improve their welfare, they are so much more hard up than we are. Um, and uh, we should um, also, uh, in, our, uh, in uh, this period of lockdown, uh, where we are uh, emphasizing um, physical distance, we should not emphasize social distance. We should still be in touch with our, with our nearest and dearest, but also focus on interfaith and uh, unity between different groups of people and feel responsible for our immediate um, family, our community, our neighborhood. Um, and, but there's one thing, we need to de-fetishize Gandhi. Um, and this is a, an interesting, a very um, humorous um, cartoon where the three monkeys hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, but nobody said anything about blogging. And in a way, Gandhi, I think, as the great communicator, not just the great healer, but a communicator, would have been the blogger of the nation. So we should defetishize him. For Gandhi didn't want a cult in his name. In a way, um, he, and he says this specifically a, a number of times. He says, you are at a, at a, um, at a conference of the Gandhi Seva Sangh in 1940. He says, you are all my fellow students and co-workers. Forget the idea of being followers. Nobody is leading and nobody is following. Um, nobody is a leader and nobody is a follower. I am eager to see Gandhism, just listen, I am eager to see Gandhism wiped out at an early date. We must really reflect on this. You should not give, your, give yourselves over to sectarianism. I did not belong to any sect. I have never dreamt of establishing any sect. If any sect is established in my name after my death, my soul would cry out in anguish. So this is what he actually said in 1940. You can check it, it's in the collected works in volume 71. But, but we don't have to form a cult in his name, but what he practiced as a political healer can serve as guidelines for us in challenging conventional wisdom or in challenging in conventional wisdom, he opened up new philosophical and practical possibilities. We need to be innovative, but in what manner do we need to change our lifestyle? It says, be the change you want to see in the world, but in what manner do we need to change our lifestyle to be receptive to his message? We can invigorate our ability to discriminate between need and greed, our ability to provide for everybody's need, but exercise self-control and socioeconomic design to minimize the greed. That is what Gandhi would lead us to. And to admit that we are not infallible, that we make mistakes, we should own up to our mistakes and listen to our inner voice um, through prayer or meditation uh, and be at peace with ourselves. We can follow our own truth, autonomy, and achieve our, our own Swaraj to bring about our own healing and that of our family, community, and society. I thank you very much. I've come to the end of my presentation. I hope it was audible. And um, I look forward to your questions. Maybe um, uh, we can also...
continue with the question answer set, uh, uh, set uh, session yes, at sir. a later time by email or WhatsApp. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present with my thoughts on this aspect. So okay, ma'am. Now, so, so I mean, we we have uh, collected some questions. There are two to three questions. So if you could just, uh, I mean, be with us. Yes, certainly. I will. I will remain here so long as the connection uh, remains. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank it'll, you. It'll be there. So yeah, please be with us, ma'am. Please be with us. Okay. Yes. We will Thank get you. into the Thank question you. and answer session. Yeah. So yeah. Um, now uh, that was a very fresh, uh, uh, very new perspectives of uh, looking at Gandhi ji, uh, whom we had not known that uh, all these are attributes of him. So saying that, uh, we, we we are going to unravel some of uh, the questions. And before that, so as we know that uh, these forty-eight days webathon shall be uh, shall be culminating on November eighteenth, twenty twenty, on Naturopathy Day. We shall be now introduced to vitality, the theme of this year's Naturopathy Day. Every day during this webathon, an aspect or factor that influences our vitality shall be explained. Therefore, Dr. Jyoti Kumbhar, Senior Medical Officer at National Institute of Naturopathy, Pune, is requested to shed light for us on today's aspect of vitality. You may please take the screen. Uh, thank you, Tanmay. Am I audible? Yeah, ma'am. Very well. Yes. Thank you, Tanman. Uh, I'm here today to speak about vitality. And uh, this year's theme for the Naturopathy Day celebrations is nurturing vitality uh, through naturopathy. So in this context, it is very important to understand what is vitality. Vitality is the amount of uh, quantum of energy which we all we are blessed with and we receive at the time of conception. And this received energy, it cannot be increased. But then whenever we rest and sleep, a certain amount of energy can be recuperated. Actually, the key principle behind the science of nature cure is to understand every living being, including uh, we humans, we have the ability to heal ourselves. Our body has its own capacity to restore itself, and provided we follow the laws of nature. And because as we receive this quantum of energy and we keep spending it all along our life, every single moment for the different functions of us, which includes uh, physiological functions, uh, recreational activities, and uh, reproductive activities, professional, occupational activities, and so on. So it is of the imperial importance that we understand uh, that we need to optimize or they use the energy, vital energy, in an optimal way so that we can economize its spend. We do have a concept of uh, vital economy where we understand uh, how to spend our energy, this vital energy, in an economic way. And there are various factors because which could impact your vitality in a positive way. And also there are factors which actually could drain your this vital energy. To remain healthy, to sustain our health, to maintain our well-being, and also to prevent ourselves from different diseases, we need to understand this concept of vitality in depth, and also the important factors that are going to uh, positively or negatively impact your vitality, and which we are going to discuss further from tomorrow onwards. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now, Geeta, ma'am, you you may take uh, you may please take the screen. Now we'll be getting into the question and answer session. Yes, ma'am. So before that, um, yes. so before getting into the question, uh, I just received a SMS from a very senior uh, uh, lady who is also into Gandhian philosophy. She said that uh, the thing you talked. Uh, regarding uh, jihad, the real aspect of jihad uh, in orthodox Islam. She very much liked it. She said that. And uh, so now we get into the question. It is from an anonymous uh, uh, person. Uh -huh. okay. 
I'm very pleased. So, yeah. So uh, it it says that uh, the the question reads as Namaste, ma'am. Firstly, I extend my sincerest prostr prostrations to your knowledge and the wisdom of your accomplished person. And then he then uh, the question is as uh, there's an anecdote in popular media that Gandhi, as a young lawyer, when rose to address the bench in the court, felt as if his heart and uh, heart had sunk into his shoes. Is it really true about Gandhi, the political leader we heard about? I ask this because there is a paramount contrast of Gandhi's strength and vigor between the anecdote I mentioned and the anecdotes you shared through your curiosity provoking talk. Yeah, uh, that's a, a very important, uh, a crucial question, a very good question. Um, and I think that in a lot of uh, Gandhiana literature, one emphasizes um, too much his shyness. Now, Gandhi may have been shy, but it was there was a reason. He felt very unwell. He felt very uncomfortable in the court because there was it was not um, um, their, their aim was not to achieve justice or to arrive at the truth. It was to um, to uh, uh, gain a p position of strength against one another, you know, and, and the lawyers had to present uh, their client's uh, position, which they may not have um, uh, approved of just because they were being paid by them. So he felt that this, uh, the way law was being carried out at the time uh, was very unhealthy, was immoral. And, and so he didn't know how to, uh, how to adjust to this system. And we see that when he goes to South Africa, he's also uh, doing law. I mean, he's the legal counsel to the, uh, uh, to the Gujarati Muslim merchant. Uh, and he arrives at a very, very um, viable conclusion where neither party um, uh, is at a loss. Uh, they both gain. And he becomes, he, I mean, he becomes quite a well, well-to-do advocate. He's living in, in style. Um, that is until he decides to uh, take up Brahmacharya in, in 1906 after the Zulu rebellion, and um, uh, then the, it becomes there's a complete transformation. But Gandhi has the courage. I mean, he has the courage, for instance, to go to England against the wishes of his family, of his clan. You know, they said that he shouldn't go to England. Uh, yeah, um, he has the courage to take up this job in South Africa. Uh, he'd never been to South Africa, didn't know anything about South Africa, but he, he goes off, leaves his family behind. Um, then when he arrives in South Africa, 10 days after his arrival, he's thrown off the train. He was supposed to stay in South Africa for just one year, but because of his involvement in this political struggle uh, to um, gain the to us in support of the rights for, for Indians living in South Africa. His stay that was originally intended just for one year is extended to nearly 22 years. So this, uh, this means that he had a lot of courage, commitment, and um, also um, his, um, he wasn't shy. You know, he, he, so I think the question was very pointed and um, I think we need to understand why was this and why is this being promoted this the one wants to make gandhi look like a, some weakling yeah. which yeah. he was not he, he may not have been physically that strong but even that he makes himself through his uh, his uh, exercises his nature cure he makes himself into a physically very strong person um so yeah i think we we need to understand gandhi um as a man um who had, who was uh, a man of steel in a way, strong as steel, um, mm -hmm. and uh, who had the courage to speak his mind. When he returns to India in 1915, he says mm -hmm. that Indians are fearful. They don't have the courage to say no. They're, they've become yes men. They've become, you know, lick your boots, uh, sir, kind of people. Okay. And we have to stand up and say, and oppose British rule, but in a non-violent way. So I think this is this is uh, um, we need to I think really try and understand Gandhi. He should not just we should not just pay lip service to him as the father of the nation, but try and understand what he stood for, and to without making a cult of him.
to, to be inspired by his spirit, by his courage, by his determination, by his commitment, his integrity. I think all this is, is very important. And um, um, uh, one thing I would also like to stress, it may not have come out so much in, in my mm -hmm. talk, is that whatever he, he practices, he derives it from Indian traditions. He's, he's through and through a, an Indian an Indian of the traditional type. And that's why he has such a mass following because the ordinary rural population, they see that he's one of them. You know, he's uh, even his Satyagraha, the civil disobedience that was being practiced um, in uh, lots of, uh, in great parts of India to resolve differences between uh, rulers and rule to, to resolve injustice. And Gandhi, um, takes this on and uh, tries to um, uh, to structure it in a modern context to oppose British rule. But he, he derives all this from Indian traditions. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I think we need to, through Gandhi, to feel more self-assured about our own traditions um, mm -hmm. and not to think, you know, we have to, th th that it's all, um, um, uh, it's negative. It's um, uh, it's backward. It's uh, something that we have to uh, cast aside and adopt uh, modern Western ways that are much better. They're not. I mean, they may be for certain uh, uh, cl climates and countries in Europe, but not necessarily uh, for the ordinary Indian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that what was rather really extended. Down for the audience is that uh, the anecdote which i just mentioned uh, the anonymous person's anecdote which sinking of heart into yes. the boots of gandhi that uh, i personally understood it as it was not shyness or it was not timidity it was just uh, uneasiness or the discomfort or the disgust yes the way exactly. courts had back then the courts even now, exactly, I mean, exactly. I, it, it would yes. be more overboard yep. to say even more, but back then yeah that was it yes. so thank you so much yeah, yeah, for that uh, we would like to just uh, top you, top the whole talk with one rapid fire question for you okay just one yes. rapid fire question. and uh, you need to answer this rapid fire question as soon as possible only in one word okay so only in one word so yeah. what comes to your mind uh, when you listen to the word gandhism Be inspired. Um, be inspired. Uh, oh, is it? Okay. 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 Be inspired. Yeah. I would not say reject Gandhism uh -huh. because that is uh -huh. too, too uh, you know, too destructive. We should be inspired mm -hmm. rather than follow him dogmatically. Hmm? Okay. So okay. be inspired by Gandhi, um, but not. Uh, follow him, follow it in a dogmatic fashion and say, you know, only this is, uh, what would Gandhi do today? Gandhi would be um, uh, doing, he would not necessarily be wearing khadi. Um, mm -hmm. he, he would perhaps be working with the slum dwellers in the cities rather than in the, uh, in the rural uh, landscape. Um, so, yeah, but you just wanted one word. So I would say we have to be inspired. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so yes. much, ma'am. That, so, uh, that was a lot of fun and also uh, fun learning and knowledge that you shared with us. So thank you so much. We look forward to having you uh, uh, with us during this webathon. We are having these um, sessions for all the 48 days till November 18th. And uh, uh, it's all a reminder to everyone also that uh, tomorrow again at 11 o'clock in the morning, Indian Standard Time, uh, we look forward to having you with uh, us. And uh, tomorrow, Professor George Matthew from Indian Institute of so uh, Social Sciences mm -hmm. uh, at Delhi will be addressing on the topic Gandhiji, Gram, Swara Gram Swaraj, and Gram Arogya. So it's going to also be an exciting talk like this. So hope uh, hope we all uh, meet tomorrow again, again. So yeah, until then, this is Tanmay, uh, the Gandhian Studies Coordinator at National Institute of Naturopathy, Pune, signing off. Yeah. Should I say goodbye? Thank you. Goodbye. Okay.